Faith City Church family, welcome back. Uh, today we're going to look at Genesis chapter 3. So take a moment uh, and read through that chapter. It'll make a lot more sense as I walk through it. So we'll be back in just a second. Okay, hopefully you've had a chance to read Genesis 3. It's obviously a pretty sobering passage. Uh, a very important passage in understanding the narrative and the arc of Scripture, uh, the theme of redemption throughout Scripture. So let's walk through it together. Chapter 3, it says, Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? I always wonder why Eve didn't say, Why are you talking to me? <laughs> Uh, I don't think there's any uh, times uh, where animals were speaking prior to that in the garden. Uh, clearly, either Satan is actually masking himself as a serpent or just controlling this serpent, but he's given it the ability to speak. And notice what he does right away is he casts doubt on, on what God has actually said. He doesn't start out um, with an outright lie, with... Um, with directly contradicting what God has said, he just plants a seed of doubt in Eve's mind. And this is often the pattern that Satan will use with us in temptation uh, because it works. <laughs> he hasn't really had to change this method over thousands of years because it works. Uh, he'll often uh, start with half-truths uh, or start with doubt, and then often he'll move towards outright lies. So he, he takes God's word and twist it. Do you remember what God had said? No, God had not said they couldn't eat from any tree in the garden. God had said you can eat from all the trees in the garden except one. So Satan twists God's word. He makes God seem uh, evil or trying to withhold good from them, and he plants this doubt. Eve responds, verse 2, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat it or touch it or you will die. Now, I always think this is interesting here because God did not specifically say they shouldn't touch it. Now, do I think touching it would have been a good idea? No, but it looks to me like Eve is already adding to God's command. And when we begin to add to God's command, we can easily stray into legalism, which actually leads us into sin as well. Uh, so she, she changes it. She adds to God's word here uh, and says that even if they touch it, they'll die. Now Satan moves to an outright lie. Verse 4, no, you will not die, the serpent said to the woman, directly contradicting God's word. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So he's basically setting it up that as if God is withholding something good from them. Uh, and, and he doesn't want them to be like him, that God is somehow um, uh, afraid of, of losing his position or something like that. Uh, and Eve falls for it. She's deceived. Her sin is not as bad as Adam's. Adam's actually is the sin that launches mankind into this fallen state. Um, she is deceived by the serpent. Adam just stupidly follows, just, just flat out rebellious. Um, verse six, the woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she sees that, hey, I could, I could know more. I don't think this is the kind of knowledge that we all want. Um, I understand it sort of as an experiential knowledge of evil. I don't want to have that knowledge, right? As we go through hard times and difficulty, um, pain, that, that's not something we look back uh, and say, wow, I have the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, that's a great thing. Um, obviously, God can use those for good, and he grows us through difficult times. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about the experience of falling into sin. Um, that's, not a, that's not a good thing in any way, but she's deceived. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who is with her, and he ate it. Failure of, of leadership in the home here, failure to obey the Lord. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked. For the first time, they sense um, a, a, a shame uh, and just kind of a vulnerability of being naked. So they sewed fig leaves together. I imagine that did not feel good. Uh, probably pretty itchy, uncomfortable, uh, but it's all they're able to do at that time. They made coverings for themselves. Uh, verse 8, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. I think this was a regular thing that God did, and he would come and spend time with them. I don't know what that looked like. <laughs> That's pretty amazing uh, that they had that kind of face-to-face -face relationship with God. Um, remember, they were sinless. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So the Lord God called out to the man and said to him, where are you? I don't think God is lacking knowledge of where Adam is. Where Adam is. Uh, he's just he's reaching out to him. Uh, he, he doesn't, I mean, God, God literally could have just right then ended the human race. 
But you can see his grace even in asking this question, where are you? He's seeking them like he's going to seek. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. It starts right here. And he said, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Then he asked, this is God, who told you that you were naked? Why, why is this a thing for you? Uh, who, who described you that way? Did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? God knows he's calling him to repentance and honesty about it. Uh, Adam does not respond to that well. Verse 12, the man replied, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate. So Adam deflects blame in two ways, to God himself, the woman you gave to be with me, and to his wife. Again, a failure of male leadership uh, and a lack of, of honesty about his sin, a lack of confession. Verse 12, so the Lord God asked the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman, again, points the blame. The woman, and the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Now that is all true. Uh, verse 14, so the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than any livestock and more than any wild animal. You will move on your belly and eat dust all the days of your life. It's pretty, I know there are some people who have snakes as pets and things like that, but pretty universally, the human race just hates snakes. I think that's partly, that's a result of this, this curse right here. Verse 15, I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. This verse, 315, burn it in your brain. Genesis 315, it's the first example of the gospel in the Bible. Um, the, old, the old scholars called it the Proto-Evangelion, the first gospel. Uh, and it's, it's a promise that even though there'll be hostility uh, between, between basically Satan, between the offspring of the, of the serpent uh, and the offspring of the woman, there will come a day where the offspring of the woman will strike his head and the serpent will strike his heel. And what we see here is a prophecy really of the cross because Jesus obviously was hurt to the point of death. Um, but if, if someone walks up to you uh, with a hammer and they said, take your pick, I'm going to hit you in one place. You want me to hit you on your heel or on your head? All of us are going to choose the heel. Uh, that's a survivable injury. You, you're going to come back from that one, uh, but not the head. You, you're probably not going to survive that one. And that's symbolic of what Jesus did at the cross. He, he took the strike on the heel. In fact, he actually died, but he came back in victory. And Satan was vanquished, was conquered once and for all. And Jesus said, it is finished. And the, the, the war is over. There are still um, battles to be fought, but the, the end has been sealed. Uh, and so this is a promise that God is going to deal with it through the seed of the woman. Uh, Kenneth Matthews writes in his commentary, he says, Whereas the man's action condemned the human family, Eve will play the critical role in liberating them from sin's consequences. And God is going to use her to bring new life into the world, and a descendant of hers way down the line will be actually God himself in the flesh who will crush the head of the serpent. I love this powerful uh, passage that in the very chapter where sin takes place, where the fall takes place, God is already ready. We know Ephesians 1, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. He knew this was going to happen, uh, but he was already ready to come in and redeem us despite the fact that we were the ones who had marred his beautiful creation and chosen rebellion. Verse 16, there are uh, consequences and a curse upon the woman as a result of the fall. He said to the woman, I will intensify your labor pains. You will bear children with painful effort. Your desire will be for your husband, yet he will rule over you. Uh, so in this, uh, obviously, childbirth is, is a painful, terrible thing. Apparently, it wasn't going to be painful at all before that. I'm curious as to what that would have been like. Um, but I don't think we'll ever know. Uh, it says, your desire will be for your husband, yet he will rule over you. Uh, there's a lot of debate about what the second half of this verse means. I believe that he's referring to um, kind of a struggle within human relationships, specifically within marriage, that a woman will often want to try to, to direct her husband, control him. Uh, many women struggle with that temptation, but he says, yet he will rule over you because this is how God has set things up. Again, Kenneth Matthews speaks to this verse. He says, uh, chapter 316b, the second half of the verse, describes a struggle for mastery between the sexes. The desire of the woman is her attempt to control her husband, but she will fail because God has ordained that the man exercise his leadership function. And that function was ordained pre-fall. Um, the male, male headship in the home is not a result of sin. We see this, by the way, the order in which God creates them. We also see this in Ephesians 5, where it shows that uh, the relationship between the man and woman in marriage points to the relationship between Christ and his church and his authority 
over his church. So it's not a result of the fall. It's not at all an excuse for husbands to be dominant or um, uh, self-serving in their relationships with their wives. In fact, Ephesians 5 tells us that a man should love his wife as Christ loved the church who loved, he loved her and gave himself for her. So a man should be self-sacrificing for his wife. Um, but this is the order that God has set up. And it's going to be harder to work out because of sin. Verse 17. And he said to the man, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, do not eat from it. The ground is cursed because of you. You will eat from it by means of painful labor all the days of your life. This is where the tedious aspect of labor comes in. Work was a gift from God, but now it's a painful and difficult thing. Uh, that doesn't mean there's no joy in in. Um, and, and fulfillment in work, um, but it's much, much harder. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. You will eat bread by the sweat of your brow until you return to the ground, since you were taken from it. For you are dust, and you will return to dust. Just like God had formed us out of the dust of the ground, we will return to that one day, and life will be difficult because of sin. Verse 20, the man named his wife Eve because she was the mother of all the living. Uh, the word Eve means living or life. Um, the Lord God, now this is a significant verse here. Uh, the Lord God made clothing from skins for the man and his wife, and he clothed them. I believe that that is another pointer to the gospel because it says that they were clothing made of skins. Remember, they had made leaves from fig trees. Again, probably not very comfortable, but God uh, makes them clothing from skins. So that means something had to die to provide a covering for them if it's a skin. Uh, and so I think that's a, uh, another pointer in this passage to the fact that Jesus would actually die, giving up his life to provide a, a permanent covering for our shame and nakedness and guilt before God. Uh, it's a small pointer. It does, this, these skins obviously don't um, remove their sin or remove their guilt before God, but God provides them. Uh, he provides the covering of their shame just like one day he would permanently, once and for all, provide covering for shame and guilt um, before him through the blood of Christ, the Lamb of God. Uh, it's a, I love that, that little picture there. Verse 22, the Lord God said, since the man has become like one of us, I think he's speaking to the other members of the Trinity, knowing good and evil, he must not reach out, take from the tree of life, eat and live forever. So God cuts off their access to the tree of life because one of the results of sin is death. So they can't be eating from that tree anymore. So the Lord God sent him away from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove the men out and stationed the cherubim, that's a type of angel, and the flaming whirling sword east of the Garden of Eden to guard the way to the tree of life. And once in the book of Revelation, we see that the tree of life has been moved to, uh, to the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, so I believe we will see it one day. I don't know if it's still on earth now, just, in, just God has hidden it, um, or if he's already moved it to heaven. I probably lean towards uh, the fact that it's still there and it's just garden, guarded and hidden um, and always will be so until we're able to access it once we're with him face to face. Um, I love this passage. Uh, obviously, it's, it's a sobering passage, but I love how right away it points to the truth of the gospel and what God is going to do. He's ready. He's not caught off guard by this. He gives us a choice whether to follow him or not. And when as a race we fall into sin, he is ready with a way of redemption. Um, and Adam and Eve are already able to look ahead to Christ, just like you and I, as Christians today, are able to look back to Christ and his sacrifice on our behalf. Well, let's pray together, and I'll give you another free resource. Father, I thank you for this passage. I thank you that in spite of our sin, you again showed yourself gracious and merciful and kind in this passage. Um, Lord, I ask that you would help us as Christians to choose to obey you, to follow you, to not rebel as Adam did. May we follow uh, the one that scripture calls the second Adam, Jesus, who in his righteousness uh, provided life uh, and the opportunity to be reconciled to you. Uh, Lord, thank you for providing covering for our sin, our shame, our nakedness, our guilt. Thank you for reconciling us uh, to yourself and to one another. And God, I ask you to protect your people from temptation. Lord, may we not be deceived. Lord, I ask you to help marriages uh, within your church to, to love one another faithfully, to not fight over control, but to um, selflessly serve one another. Uh, Lord, thank you for this truth. Um, may we uh, walk in, in your truth and in your light today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, today uh, today's free resource. Uh, you need to go check out christianaudio.com. That's one long phrase, Christian Audio. Dot com. Uh, they have lots of audiobooks um, all, all month, 
but at the beginning of every month, usually it's not the first day, it's five days or so into the month, they offer a free audiobook every month. I have gotten a, a pretty large collection of free audiobooks just by going on there and checking it uh, near the beginning of every month. I actually have a calendar reminder that pops up and reminds me, go check christianaudio.com so I don't miss them. Uh, and uh, I think right now there's a book by Dietrich Bonhoeffer that's free on there, uh, unless they change it before I post this. Uh, christianaudio.com, they actually have their own app that you can put on your phone, download them, play it as you um, work out, running, walking. Uh, I, I like to do them while I'm doing chores around the house or on a long drive. Uh, that's a great way to redeem that time and be able to study and grow in your faith. christianaudio.com, take care. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.